Okay. Well, how would we get started on that? Um, I wasn't sure this was the answer. Okay, well, let's just take a look at the method you used. What, where, where's your method? Uh, Sorry, it's right here. Oh, okay. So you took the antiderivative right. plus C and then took the derivative Good. of that, which is another. Um, okay. Answer. Yeah, looks like your general method is right, so let's just make sure that the details are right. So what was the question asking us for? It's asking us for f, which is the antiderivative of the antiderivative of this. So we have to take some antiderivatives. Now, again, you want to make sure you have the signs right. The first antiderivative is a negative sign in front of it. And there's a constant of integration. So this would be the first antiderivative. Mm -hmm. and then we have the second antiderivative. symbol inside the derivative and outside. And this antiderivative is a special one, the natural log. Uh, and now we're outside the derivative, so I'll go back to x. <coughs> so here's what I get for f. Does that match what you had? Mm -hmm. Okay. So far, so good. So first of all, we have to be very comfortable with taking antiderivatives. All right, and now we have to figure out what these are. So we plug in. Uh, f of 1 is 1. So that would give us negative natural log of 1 plus c times 1 plus d equals 1. And we have negative natural log of 2 plus 2c plus d equals 0. All right. Uh, and now this is an algebra problem of two equations and two unknowns. I guess I would solve the simpler equation. Oh, so this equation simplifies because what's the log of 1? Zero. Zero. So this becomes c plus d equals 1, or d equals 1 minus c. So this is negative natural log of 2 plus 2c plus 1 minus c plus c plus 1. Zero. So we get C is the natural log of 2 minus 1. And we get D is, by plugging this into here, So this is what I think the final answer would be. How you would start? Because I know for number 13, the problem above, it would just be um, whatever is in. 
inside the integral. Right. But I forget what you're supposed to do if you have variables on the integral. So what you were mentioning is you know how to deal with this type of situation. If you're just trying to find the derivative with respect to x, when x is the upper limit of integration, that's just the integrand evaluated at x. Now there's also a formula for the more complicated case. Where we have a function of x on the top and a function of x on the bottom and a function in the middle. Would you split it up into two different ones? Yeah, well, I'll write down the formula, but it sounds like what you're saying is right. So this is the general formula for taking the derivative of a definite integral with respect to a variable that appears in the limits of integration. Well, it's complicated even to say what we're talking about. Uh, but here we're trying to take the derivative of a definite integral, and what we're taking the derivative with respect to, that appears in the limits of integration. So there's just a cookbook formula that we can use for that. It's a pretty complicated formula, but we can illustrate how it works for this problem. <coughs> Basically, it's the derivative of the top integral times the function evaluated at the top integral minus the derivative, um, the derivative of the top limit times the function evaluated at the top limit minus the derivative of the bottom limit times the function evaluated at the bottom limit. And you should be able to see, if you do a little work, that this is just a special case of this. Well, can you repeat that? So what we're doing here is we're taking the derivative of the, of the top limit and multiplying it times the function in the integral evaluated at the top limit. And then we're subtracting the derivative of the bottom limit times the function in the, in the integral evaluated at the bottom limit. It'll be clear when we do this example here how this works. But you can kind of see that that's the, fun, the formula that we used up here. Uh, so for example, here, what's the derivative of the top limit? Well, the derivative of the top limit is 1. So we didn't have to include it specifically. And then we simply evaluated the function at the top limit. Well, this function at the top limit is f of x. Then we took the derivative of the bottom limit. But that was 0 here, so that term didn't appear. So this formula that we used here was really a special case of this. But let's go through this example, and it'll be easier to see how to work with this. So derivative of y with respect to x equals. OK, so what is our g prime going to be for this example? Yeah. g prime is the derivative of the top limit of integration. g is the top limit of integration, and g prime is its derivative. Well, here our top limit is x, and its derivative is 1. So far so good? Mm -hmm. All right. And now f is the function in the integral, and we evaluate it at g, which is the top limit. So here we have cosine Cosine t squared is the function, but what should I plug in for t? X. X, which is the top limit. So for t, I'll plug in an x. And now we've accomplished what this term is telling us to do. We took the derivative of the top limit, and then we took the function inside the integral and evaluated it by plugging in the top limit. Does that make any sense? All right. Now notice the subtraction sign. Don't forget the subtraction. Now what should we? Uh, what is h prime going to be in this case? Yeah, so h is the bottom limit of integration. So h prime would be the derivative of this, which is negative sine of x. So we got to be careful with the signs. We have a subtraction and a negative sign. And now f is the function that we're taking the integral of, and we need to evaluate that at the bottom limit. So the function we're taking the integral of is the cosine of t squared. And what should I plug in for t now? Cosine x? 
Yeah, what this tells us is plug in the bottom limit of integration into f. So our final answer can't have a t in it, because t is just a, a dummy variable in this integral. Our final answer should just be in terms of x. So I'm going to get rid of the t, and in, in place of t, I'm plugging in the bottom variable, which is cosine of x. So to write this to make sure it's clear, so this should be the cosine of x squared. And then we're taking the cosine of that. This would also be a legal way of writing that. A cosine squared can be written like this. 